Vietnam 14 World Congress uh, by uh, Dr. Chico Vaz. Kevin C. From Kevin. Former head of neurology at Goa Medical College. Uh, this Congress was inaugurated by late Mother Saint Teresa in Mumbai. And that was the reason for starting the uh, foundation and the start of the Biomedical Ethics Center by our late patron, uh, Archbishop Sinan Pimenta. And here you see the uh, Dr. Shikovas, the, the founder of the Biomedical Ethics Center. Uh, at the Biomedical Ethics Center, we have been doing a lot of uh, national seminars, as you can see here. Uh, some of them have been inaugurated by uh, our late uh, Prime Minister Gujral, and also uh, guest of honor was uh, late uh, former Chief Minister of Goa, Dr. Wilfred D'Souza. We have been also having annual biomedical, uh, bioethical courses and the architect for this was uh, Father Stephen Fernandez, who is a doctorate in healthcare ethics and a professor of moral theology. We also uh, introduced ethics in uh, Bombay Orthodox Society when I was the president of the Bombay Orthodox Society and we had a uh, lot of uh, ethical and legal uh, dilemmas discussion and uh, we even have essay competition on ethics when I was in the uh, chair of the president of the society. We also done some publications uh, and also collaborated with other uh, organizations like the Asian Federation of Biomedical Ethics and the president, Dr. Russell uh, D'Souza is here in the center. Coming to the world, bioethics is largely regarded to have its beginning in the 1960s in the United States. But bioethics actually originated in 1927 with a German Protestant theologian named Fritz Schaar, who defined the term in his paper, a review of ethical relationships of humans to animals and plants. And he proposed a bioethical imperative outlining the concept of bioethics as an academic discipline, principle, and virtue. That led to uh, Professor Karmi, the head of UNESCO chair in Haifa in bioethics, to, to remember the bioethics throughout the world and to foster the principle of bioethics, he started the World Bioethics Day. Because one must remember that the science of bioethics is vast, challenging in view due to the new introduction of new machines by engineers and new scientific research by scientists. The theme of the first World Bioethics Day was in 2016 was human rights and dignity. And the universe unanimous decision that was taken on that meeting in 2016 was not to do genetic manipulation to change the inherited germline. 2017, the World Bioethics Day, the theme was equality, justice, equity. The third World Bioethics Day had solidarity and cooperation as the theme. And the fourth, last year, the theme was respect for cultural diversity. The fifth World Bioethics Day was supposed to be held this year in October, but due to the pandemic, it is uh, taken to March, and that's going to be in Portugal. And the theme is bioethics, medical ethics, and the law. We also celebrated World Bioethics Day last year, and we had Father Christopher, Professor of Ethics at the St. John Medical College, to deliver a lecture to us on Catholic response to Supreme Court verdict on passive euthanasia and advanced directives. And 
and portions of his uh, thesis was taken by i am told by the supreme court to deliver their verdict dr mithil uh, talked on uh, clinical application of bioethics in vulnerable population and father stephen talked on ethics and care of creation we also inaugurated the uh, newsletter named touching lives and uh, we had um, the following topics then looking back and going forward new perspective in bioethics importance of bioethics palliative care and ethics dental care ethics and the delegates who attend the course also gave their feedback all of us are familiar with this uh, nobel role uh, laureates in uh, chemistry emmanuel chapinter and jennifer duda who was awarded the uh, the prize nobel prize for the genetic caesar caesars in crispr and cas technology which allows you to change the dna of animals plants microorganisms to change the genes of the diseases and with the aim that will help to bring about therapy in lot of diseases that can be cured by uh, modifying the genes but there was a lot of hue and cry by the ethical committee whether this would be done properly or not and in the words of nefa uh, duda recorded that she was saying how can it happen how we be if it happens how to be control it can it, and if it happens can we even control it in any reasonable sense of the word and her fear was seen in uh, in the work of uh, Dr. He Juan Kui from China, from the Shenzhen Clinic, who uh, did the first ever experiment and brought about gene-edited babies, because he, as a biologist, wanted name and fame. Since two pregnant ladies came to him to do the research, which was never done in the world. and he defied government bans and conducted research on those uh, embryos in pursuit of personal fame and gain and seriously violated the academic ethics and code of conduct for which the chinese government and medical board he was fined i'm told 500000 dollars and is prison for prison for 3 months 3 years and so also his associates were equally um, prison but for a lesser period and for a lesser fee so the fear was the designer babies that would come into the world and more than 100 chinese scientists said this dr he juan ku must be us akutis who was a, a genius in technology and used all the technology for the benefit of the mankind and life beyond the border and the highway to god and was uh, honored by the church as a blessed carlos awaiting his uh, canonization all of uh, some of you all must have uh, seen this movie called bemisal which was a film by hari prasad mukherjee starring amitabh bachchan vinod mehra and rakhi where there is a love triangle uh, affecting two friends and a heroine and where the doctor is projected as a hero and an anti hero hero doctor goes on a cycle as a barefoot doctor and the anti hero again a doctor who comes with knowledge after doing his qualification abroad and does remember the old proverb whatever good you do remains with you and whatever bad you do comes back haunting to you Mahatma Gandhi said I object to violence because when it appears to be good the good is only temporary the evil it does is permanent so remember the good you do gives you joy and also joy to the receiver and with this
I uh, now uh, give you a warm welcome again and uh, try to introduce the speakers for our uh, uh, session. The first speaker is uh, Dr. Anukan Mithal. He is our academic dean and trustee of the Biomedical Ethics Center, a consulting psychiatrist, head of the department of uh, Rajiv Gandhi Medical College in, um, in uh, Thane. He is also uh, chair of the bioethics in Western Zone, India, uh, involved in a lot of charitable work to give psychiatric uh, uh, counseling to lesser privileged children, and also an examiner in uh, diploma in psychiatry and, uh, and uh, <coughs> a diploma of national. Over to you, Dr. Anukan Mithal. Good evening, everybody. Good morning, everybody who is not in India. And a good day to you from wherever you are. Uh, it's a very warm welcome to you uh, to this celebration of World Bioethics Day. Uh, the reason uh, we are celebrating on web is obvious to all that it is the COVID times when we, we do not meet because of various uh, restrictions. The World Bioethics Day has been celebrated for the last five years in a major way in every center across the globe. There are about 200 bioethics centers in the India alone. Uh, the concept was uh, initially by the whole committee, uh, which met in Naples, that we need to set up a particular day where we celebrate the propagation of ethical values amongst the lay people and everybody. And that is one of the reasons. What happened, Nicholas? You can't hear me? Uh, yeah, I'm taking off my presentation. Okay. So, uh, basically, uh, what uh, Dr. Nicholas said was about the CRISPR technology, which is one laureate and which has become the flavor of the month now because suddenly the two uh, people who have uh, been experimenting with that have attained the coveted Nobel Prize. However, uh, genetic manipulation and manipulating uh, the progeny uh, has been going on for a long time. In fact, in just uh, today's paper, there is a story about how uh, a child with hemophilia had his, uh, had his parents, the child didn't, but the parents of this child had actually conceived and uh, given birth to a child who will be providing regular donor as, as a regular donor for the elder sibling. And if you have looked, if you've seen the picture, uh, my uh, sister's keeper, I think with uh, uh, Cameron Diaz, I think, uh, it was about a girl who in her early teens realizes that she was conceived and given birth to only because she could provide organs and blood transfusions for her elder sister who was born with a genetic disease. So this has been the practice uh, and this has not been questioned by any ethical body or any ethical concerns because the obvious gray area between the actual intent and the stated intent of this artificial manipulation and progeny being produced. We, as Dr. Antao said, have to be very careful because there is a lot of uh, conflict that we are going to face uh, between our value systems, uh, uh, a sense of duty to our profession, a sense of duty to our values, and a sense of duty to our profession. Uh, there are times when therapeutic obstinacy, uh, the, uh, the paternalistic attitude that we are accustomed to would infringe on the rights of the patient and the relatives uh, when we would actually uh, enforce our will and our need to satisfy our ego by continuing procedures or performing procedures that in the end may violate one of the basic tenets of bioethics of do no harm. 
or violate the autonomy of the patient and the relatives. So on this World Bioethics Day, we would like everybody here to solemnly, you know, pledge to themselves in front of their own gods that they would try their best to maintain as neutral and as positive an ethical value within themselves and their behaviors, uh, at least in the healthcare field, uh, to the best of their ability. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Nicholas. Uh, can I hand over to you again to carry on the uh, further academic program? Dr. Nicholas? Uh, yeah. Sharon? Sharon? Where is she going? Uh, well, you already have Dr. Marelli's uh, thing on the screen. Yeah. Uh, pleasure to introduce Professor Dr. Marelli Rios de los Uriarte. She is a PhD in uh, philosophy, a master in bioethics, a professor and researcher of bioethics at the Anahuac University in Mexico, chairholder of clinical bioethics. Editorial Coordinator of Medicine and Ethics Journal and Research Scholar in Bioethics and Human Rights. It was nice of you, uh, Dr. Marielli, to join us for this World Bioethics Day. We will always remember you having joined us uh, and uh, delivered us the lecture on role of bioethics in the construction of peace. Over to Dr. Marielli. Thank you. Good evening to everyone there. Thank you very much. I'm very happy to share with you uh, some, some of these ideas. And I especially would like to thank Father Stephen Fernandez for the invitation. And um, I, I will try to share something with you right now. Let's, uh, can you tell me if you can see that? Yes, you can? Okay. Yes, we yes, can. Yes, very clear. Okay. Yes. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you so much. So... Um, I'm, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to share with you some ideas concerning the construction of peace because we have seen and witnessed in the last, uh, I would say, 10 or 15 years that violence has been increasing worldwide. So let's, uh, uh, let's think and let's reflect upon the role of bioethics in the construction of peace. First of all, I would like to share with you some of the uh, Pope Francis words uh, by the beginning of this year in January the 1st. And he, he says basically that we must wait and hope for peace. Otherwise, peace is not going to come. If we do not have this in the horizon, if we do not hope for peace, peace will not come. But peace must be accompanied by a patient work, by truth, by truth and justice, by the memory of the victims, by a shared common hope. And we must always understand that peace is not once and for all, it's not a definite step, but a progress, a, a work in progress. So this is Pope Francis. Now, these are some images that uh, here in Mexico, we live daily, we live uh, many violent situations with people disappearing all over our country and this is daily with approximately 100 murders per day so we kind of know the situation of violence is not the only country but Mexico is a very violent country so um, there are some definitions on violence the first thing is to to try to define what violence is and some of the subtle differences between violence and conflict, violence and aggression. I would just center myself in number three and number four. I can share this presentation with you. You can have it so you can study it later. But I would like to center my attention in number three and number four. Number three is very important because uh, as Professor Johan Galtung, a sociologist and Norwegian mathematician, says violence comes when we witness the difference between what can be and what is. 
This is between the potential and the actual reality. And this is very important because when we realize that things can be different, but they aren't, then we kind of start feeling that we must do something. And this feeling can easily be transformed into forms of violence. And number four is very important because besides being just an aggression from one individual or a group of individuals to another individual or a group of individuals, it says that this is a Mexican professor, Jose Sols, that works in uh, a Jesuit university here in Mexico. And he puts this uh, remarkable um, structure that, that he, he says that violence can also come from a social structure. And this is very important because social structures are almost and almost all the time are invisible. So we must understand that violence can come from either an individual, a group of individuals, or a social structure. And the most important thing is that it comes with a conscience that harm is being done to another individual. So that's why we must also make this subtle difference between violence and aggression, they're not the same, and sometimes we tend to confuse them. Aggression is a biological thing, it's a natural thing, it's an inherent thing that comes usually with the feeling that our life or the life of our beloved ones is in great danger. So this is very important because it's an instinct. It is natural that we uh, become aggressive if our life or the life of our loved ones is in danger. While violence implies freedom and will, this is uh, very important because it's not an instinct, it's a rational decision that we make. So aggression is not violence, but if we some freedom and will to it, then it will become violence. So violence is a decision that we make. It's not natural, it's a decision made by our freedom and our will. There's another difference that we must have in mind. That is the difference between conflict and violence. Conflict, as aggression in the last uh, idea that I expressed, conflict is anthropological. Conflict is natural. It is given because of our natural diversity. I'm from Mexico, you're from India, maybe we have some other people connected from other parts of the world. And this is diversity. But diversity as something anthropological, as something inherent to our uh, human nature, allows growth. Conflict, if well conducted, allows personal and community growth. The road to peace is not exempt from conflicts. Conflicts are natural in the progress and in the process of prosecuting um, peace. But conflict must, must never be a justification for violence. Some people tend to, um, tend to join the idea of diversity with the idea of violence. This is incorrect. Diversity provokes conflict and conflict is an opportunity for growth. But diversity, our conflicts, our natural conflicts, must never be a justification for violence. Now, violence has one of the most important dangers that, uh, be, of, of violence can be that it can easily be spread and it can easily be normalized. And when we normalize violent conducts, then we are in danger to start creating a culture of violence. And this is the biggest danger in violence because this culture of violence is so uh, subtle, is so many times even invisible that it can be created just by transforming symbols, the language, the news we see every day and we hear every day, children games, ideologies, and video games. So through these, Culture of violence is instaurated in a community. And when we realize it, it's so instaurated that now it's very difficult to eradicate it. So we must be very careful because violence can easily be spread and can easily be instaurated in a community by forms, by many subtle forms, constructing a culture of violence. 
Now, there's a, uh, what specialists call, call the cycle of violence. And this is very important to understand then the role of bioethics in the reconstruction of this cycle. So first of all, a person uh, that, uh, w when we're talking about violent persons, when we're talking about that uh, there has been a violent effect on a community or on someone else, we must go steps behind and analyze that this violent event first began with the search of oneself, with the search of my essence, with the search of my identity. I, as a person, need an identity. And that identity can also be social identity. So in the search for our identity, we encountered the second step, which is that alterity or otherness, I found yesterday that it can also be named as otherness, is an obstacle for the search of myself. So this is where violence begins, uh, because there, there can be, if I see the other as an obstacle for the development of myself and for the search of my own um, uh, identity, then I can, uh, derive to mainly three different types of violence. The identitarian violence, which is from uh, in, in this encounter with myself and the other, then I can just annulate the other one and I can impose myself to other people. Then there's a second type, which is possessive violence, where I relate the being with the having. So I want what the other has so that it can give me identity. That's the, that's the, the psychology are canceled or vital needs are not uh, considered, are ignored. That is food, health, security, home, freedom, culture, peace, etc. So when one of these is canceled in our lives, then we tend to react with desperate violence. Then the third step is the destruction of alterity, is if I understand that otherness is an obstacle, then I tend to destruct other. The fourth step is auto-destruction. The, the offender, the aggressor, usually when destructing the other, finally destructs himself. So the aggressors have ruined themselves and they know it. And because they know it, sometimes it takes time for them to know it, but eventually they will know it. And then when, then, when, when they know it, then we go to the fifth step, which is lamentation, which is the dramatic recognition of the mistakes done. So when the aggressor recognizes that he has destruct himself as well as destruct others, then he recognizes and he laments for his actions. This is the most important part because if, we, if the offender or the aggressor does not lament, then we cannot go to the sixth and to the seventh and to the eighth step. Uh, but when recognized, then we can start the reconstruction. And the reconstruction begins first with the return to the word. The offender talks to himself again, the word, in a self-dialogue, the word where he talks to himself. Then he is prepared to talk to others, and this is the other step, return to the word as a form of dialogue. So this is where we, uh, where bioethicists come in, because the attentive listening is a fundamental part of the reconstruction of the person. Then the memory, assuming what happened, then the reconstruction, the refoundation of one's own life, according to the other in my life, and finally, the search of oneself again, but including the other, not, not being aggressive to the other, not destructing the other, but including him or her into my life so that we can reconstruct ourselves. This has happened, this is the cycle that has been studied in cases like South Africa, like the Basque country in, um, in Spain, in North Ireland and also in Colombia. So this cycle is very important. Now, very briefly, I, I will not uh, be very profound in these two next pages, but um, just to understand that there are Jochen Galtung and some others that have studied the violence effect, the, the, well, violence is a uh, phenomenon that worldwide um, have 
shown and have discovered that mainly we can talk about a direct violence, which is the act performed from uh, an individual or a group to another individual or to another group. And that is easily uh, understood and easily seen is the first thing that we see. But then behind the direct violence, usually there's a structural violence. And this structural violence is invisible. It comes down to social and political systems that might neglect people's rights for health, peace, freedom, etc. But then more, uh, I, as, I, as I said earlier, um, more difficult to eradicate is the cultural violence. And this is more difficult to eradicate because it usually is not visible. We do not understand and we do not see this cultural violence until we see a child grabbing a weapon and offending someone. So we do not understand and we are not conscious enough to understand how this cultural violence has become part of our daily lives. So this is the most important thing. We must always be alert of many subtle forms in which we are becoming more violent each time. And we are normalizing violent conducts that should not be normalized. Then Teresa Goldwyn Felt, that's another specialist and um, an American uh, lawyer, um, says that violence is like the stealing other people's narrative. So what we should do to restore the uh, to restore peace is to restore others' narrative. Remember the cycle of violence to restore dialogue, to restore the word. The word is a means for peace. Those are just two ideas that I just wanted to show to you. Now, let, <coughs> let's go to the most important part of this uh, day, and that's the, the, the reason why we are all gathered here today. So um, what, what does bioethics have to do with this? Well, bioethics, if understood at the, as the ethics of life, and we uh, assume that the affirmation of life is an ontological imperative, then bioethics has an important role in the construction of peace. There's one definition, but you already know many definitions of, um, of bioethics, but they all have to do with the ethical conduct in front of the sciences of life and not the sciences of health. Now, what I propose here is that bioethics can have a preventive and a mediator role in the construction of peace. And this concerning three of its functions. Bioethics, first of all, is the promotion and the defense of health. So health is a means for the person to be operative, for the person to be integral, for the person to function in his society. So the promotion and defense of health with the principles of beneficence and non-maleficence is one of the most important actions that bioethics can do as, uh, as a mediator for the construction of peace. Number two, the integral protection of human person and environment. And this concerning the principle of vulnerability and recognizing that we are all in a vulnerable position to be offended by others, but also, and more important, to be offenders to others. So we can also, we, we all can be victims, but we're, we all can be aggressors. So bioethics promotes an integral protection for people and for the environment, also with the principle of justice, of dignity, and of common good. And the third function that bioethics, uh, but that bioethics uh, makes that can put it in a uh, in a mediator role is the search for solutions. As we all know, bioethics is an interdisciplinary uh, science that uses mainly dialogue to promote solutions, to search for solutions. So respecting personal autonomy and, um, and, and, and gathering people from all disciplines, bioethics, one of its main goals is to promote dialogue, and dialogue is a very essential part of peace. Now, um, with the, the principles, besides the principle that I mentioned here, 
uh, there are some other principles that can promote and can make us go further this process of peace. The first one is the principle of inherent and irrestrictive respect for dignity of people. And this has to do with the recognition, remember the cycle of violence, with the recognition that my essence, that my identity also needs the identity of the others, also needs otherness. So my identity and otherness and alterity are constitutive elements of my dignity. And these are the very last steps in the cycle of violence. Then the second principle is the respect of autonomy. People that are informed are people that can make decisions. People who are not informed cannot make the decisions. And peace is a decision. That's why Pope Francis told us at the beginning, we must wait for peace. We must hope for peace. Peace does not come if not waited. So in order for us to make the decisions to start walking in the direction of peace, we must be informed. Then sociability, the principle of sociability, that in the cycle of violence refers to the, the transit from silence to speech, the transit from silence to the word. But this requires two actions. First, an attentive listening. That's what we do as bioethicists, as clinical bioethicists. And the second is to promote dialogue. Now, dialogue has three different uh, phases. When it comes down to the political arena, dialogue can be named as amnesty. The decision not to judge certain crimes in order to advance in the process of peace. When it comes to, this, to the personal arena, to the personal field, dialogue has the form of forgiveness. And when it comes down to the social field, dialogue has the phase of reconciliation. But this last, the reconciliation needs the will of people. If there is no will, then there will not be a reconciliation. And the fourth, the fourth principle of bioethics that promotes peace is justice. Justice as restitutive justice or as restorative justice. When damage can be restituted, we must restitute it. When damage cannot be restituted, then we must need the restoration of the before order. So uh, in this restoration, in this um, process of justice, one of the most important things is to restitute victims' dignity, but also the offender's dignity. The many peace uh, processes focus on the victims, but not all peace processes focus on the offenders. And the offender has a dignity also. So bioethics must promote both people's dignity by equal. And also the reconstruction of the social fabric that in so many cases can be broken. Now, I'm, I'm uh, beginning the end of this presentation now. There's another important thing that we must understand. Peace does not mean pacification, though the first is not accomplished without the second. Sometimes we confuse peace with pacification. Peace, as I said in the first page, is a long-term road a work in progress, while pacification are immediate actions with short-term objectives. So actions that we do in a, on a daily basis contribute to the process of peace, but one or two or three actions are not peace by itself. But peace requires at least two concrete but progressive actions. One, go to the deepest causes of it, to the deepest causes of violence. We tend to go to the superficial ones because those are the ones that we see. But if we, if we go further, if we go deeper the, uh, in, the, in the causes of violence, sometimes these causes might even be constructed in the history of a country. So we must go there in order to understand what really is happening in, with the increase of violence. And the second one, make the decision to start walking in the direction of the construction of peace. If we see that peace is a long term, then we might be disappointed and 
uh, and we might be tempted not to start walking in that direction. So we must make the decision to start walking in that direction. Um, Ignacio Yacuria, for those of you who might not know it, know him, um, he was a Jesuit, a theologian and philosopher, a Jesuit who was murdered in the civil war in El Salvador in 1989. And he had a very important role in the construction of peace in El Salvador. And he used to say, peace must be realized in truth, constructed by justice, animated by love, and done in freedom. Truth, justice, freedom, and love. Without them, there is no possible peace. So these are the elements for peace. If we want to accomplish peace, then we must seek for social justice, construct truth, make freedom, and promote dignity. So as conclusions for this, number one, violence is a very evident fact in both national and international scenarios. You are in India, I'm in Mexico, and we're both experiencing and watching uh, violence everywhere. So the ethical options to face it are one, try to make a profound examination of violence, going to the deepest causes of, of, the, of it. And the second one, make the decision right now, today, and the World Bioethics Day can be a good day to make the decision to start walking in the direction of the construction of peace. Second, violence can either be an isolated act performed from an individual to another individual or from a group to another group, but it can also be structural violence. This is very dangerous form of violence because, because it um, deprives people from essential needs, but it can also be cultural violence. So we must examine if we are already inside a culture of violence and how it has been uh, done in, and how it has been instaurated in our community. Third, violence is performed with will and freedom, which means that will and freedom help us eradicate it. If violence is a decision, peace is a decision as well. Bioethics as an interdisciplinary and humanist science must play the role of facilitator and mediator in the promotion of, 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 of a culture of peace. How bioethics with its principles, the inherent and irrestrictive respect for dignity, freedom and autonomy, sociability and justice can reconstruct the essential cycle of violence and, and therefore can make both victims and aggressors uh, willing to walk in the same direction. Six, peace to be so cannot be separated from justice, truth, freedom, and dignity. All these four are the core elements be celebrated and recognized as victory. Celebration of a step is essential for the process and the construction of peace. And finally, there's this uh, teaching of Pope Paul VI in Popularum Progressio 1976, who says that development is the new name of peace. Many social structures deprive people from the essential needs. When we pay attention to them, usually their decision is not towards violence, but towards peace. So that will be uh, all as it comes from me. I, I, again, thank you so much. And I'm very happy to be with you. I'm very happy to, to continue listening to all your comments. Thank you very much for the invitation. Thank you, Professor Dr. Marielli, for a wonderful lecture on the role of bioethics in the construction of peace and stressing the fact that truth, justice, Freedom and love are so very important in the construction of peace and how bioethics can help us in constructing the same. Uh, uh, our next speaker today is uh, Reverend Father Ak Archibald Rafael Gonzalez, who is a former superior, provincial superior of the Carmelites, OCD. He has a master's 
and doctorate in moral theology from Rome. He has written several books. Uh, to name a few, The Beginning of the Human Individual, A Western and Indian Perspective, How Did I Begin, A Profile Approach, and several articles on prayer, prayer life, spiritually, global ethics, and uh, most important one in this uh, days is uh, Should Human clothing, Cloning Be Permitted? An Ethical Perspective. Uh, Father will talk to us on ethical perspectives of COVID-19 pandemic. We as orthopedic surgeons have seen this kind of issues in the hospital when a lot of people with COVID get admitted. One does not know whom to give the admission rights to the young man, to the old man. The old man who have contributed so much to the society, the, old, the young man who is had to start his role in the society. So there is a lot of ethical dilemma the poor man or the rich man and Father Archibald will enlighten us on the ethical perspective during this uh, pandemic. Over to you, Father Archibald. And thank you very much for uh, joining us on this day to deliver this lecture. Good evening, everybody. Happy Bioethics Day. Hope you can hear me. Can you hear me? Yes, Father. Yes. At the very outset, I am very At happy. At the very outset, I am very happy. Seminar. I would like to thank Father Stephen Fernandez, my good friend and colleague. We have been working together for inviting me to deliver this lecture this evening on this topic on COVID-19 and ethical perspective. Uh, thank you also. Dr. Antao and uh, Dr. Mittal and Dr. Jessel and I'm happy I could listen to Professor Mariel and I'm looking forward to listen to Dr. Anton Devasia on clinical bioethics. For my part, the aspect of COVID-19, this pandemic, how we should deal about it will be the topic on which I will be speaking now. First, let me begin with some slides here. COVID-19 is a novel coronavirus disease. You know that it was all started in Hubei province in China in December 2019, someone casually said anything that comes from China doesn't last very long, but this has lasted quite a long time. We know about the SARS epidemic that came up in the year 2003. We are also heard about the Spanish flu, which is from 1918 to 1920 for a period of two to three years, which took around 500 million people which was one third of the population in those days. And that pandemic was something which could not be contained by the world of science in those days. And today we have got COVID-19, which even developed countries like America, Trump said, well, we, are, we can face this. It is not very difficult for us. We are an advanced country, but we know today the highest number of casualties are seen in America. India stands second. It comes from the Corona family virus because it has got a shape of a crown. The SARS-CoV-2 is the name of the virus. The name was given in February 11, 2020. The SARS is coming from severe acute respiratory syndrome. And we know that another virus is Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. These are the two viruses that have been known. That's why the new name given to this particular virus, which gave us COVID-19, SARS-CoV-2, which was given by the International Committee of Taxonomy on Viruses. Similarly, the name COVID-19 
was also given on February 11, 2012, guided by the Organization of Animal Health as well as the Food Agricultural Organization, both under the UNO. This particular virus comes from the animals. That's why we call it zoonotic virus. Because SARS-CoV transmitted from civet cats to humans. That's why we say it is coming from bats. Whereas Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is committed from, transmitted from dromedary camels to humans. Animals as such have got many of these viruses. Not that human beings get easily infected by them or affected by them. Once a while something pops up. There are many reasons, but we do not have a conclusive evidence how this virus got into human system. The incubation period is any time between one day to 27 days. The recovery, the recovery may take three to six weeks. The symptoms that are seen are fever, cough, fatigue, shortness of breath. Various other symptoms are there like sore throat, headache, cough, protein production. These are other symptoms which may be seen in some and not in others. Now we find that this particular virus can be fatal. But it is only, as for the statistics, only 2% or less than 2% people have died of those who are infected. Look at the graph. You can very well understand those of them who are infected are all above the age of 60. The highest number is above the age of 80. For example, noted international personalities like Bruce Williams, a singer who died at the age of 49. Nick Cordero, a Broadway artist who died at the age of 41. In India, our ex-president Pranab Mukherjee, S.P. Balasubramaniam, Rishi Kapoor, Irfan Khan, just to name a few great personalities in hundreds of them have died. It is said over 200 priests have died because of COVID-19. Father, Father, can I interrupt you for a minute? Can you share the screen? You have not shared the screen and the presentation. Video is not available. Yeah, it's okay now. We can see it now. Father, you can can you go to a uh, yeah light show? Please. Yeah, okay. Right. Can you see the screen now? Yes, yeah, yeah. yes. Okay, sorry, sorry. sorry. Can, okay. See, look at the people that have died. It is not the youngsters those who have died. Uh, it is only those who are mortality is very high in those persons who are the above the age of 60 and highest is above the age of 80. One of the reasons why people have died because of comorbidity, meaning to say simultaneously they have got other health conditions. What could be the ones? The highest people who have succumbed are cardiovascular disease, second is diabetes, third chronic respiratory disease, hypertension, cancer. If you have no other health condition, I mean, your recovery rate is very high because it is 0.9% of those people without any other health condition have died. What are the risk factors? We know that kids with less severe disease are something like and only 2% of those who are infected have died. Whereas the highest number of these people are of senior citizens above the age of 80 and above with comorbidity. Look at the statistics. As for the current statistics up to date today, we have got around 40 million people, 3 crore 99 lakhs of these persons have been infected as on today. The new case just for one day is 3 lakh 72,000. The death rate is anywhere 
11 lakhs 14,000, whereas around 29 million have recovered. This is the world statistics. If you want to know the statistics of India, as on this day, India has got around 74 lakhs 92,000 cases of those infected. The death is just about 1 lakh, and recovery is of around 65 lakh 94,000. So the new cases is 62,092, which shows that within a short time, India will become number one, because the number of deaths in India are on the increase, are on the increase. The management of this particular disease, no specific treatment is available, no antiviral drugs licensed by Food and Drug Administration, FDA, till now. Corticosteroids to be People are speaking about vaccine, but we should know that pandemics like dengue and HIV, even today, we don't have vaccines for these. So there are so many companies who are vying with one another just to bring out a vaccine. But there are pessimists who say vaccine is not possible. That is all proof. There may be vaccine that may cover only 50% of the infection. Whereas the medication also is going on a basis of trial and error. So what are the preventions? The preventive methods that are highlighted are SOP, Standard Operating Procedures. This, first of all, we are doing the triaging of patients on priority basis. We have got like wear a mask, wash your hands, keep social distance. Because this disease is contagious, not like HIV, but this is contagious through the droplets. The droplets remain in the air for about 10 feet distance. They are not airborne but they can infect the other person. When it is on metal or fabric, they can survive for about 12 hours. And even on hands, they can survive for 10 minutes. So within that time, a lot of things can happen. So there is the World Health Organization, or we have got Centers for Disease Control. They would like to give a certain SOP, Standard Operating Procedure, guidelines given by them, even for the countries, how to deal with this pandemic. Now we'll go to the ethical challenges that are faced by. First of all, we should know COVID-19 has brought in a lot of challenges all over the world. It is spread over 200 countries. So every country is facing its own challenge. For example, our country like India, we, have, we are nearing 200 days of lockdown. We began on March 24th, till now it is a lockdown in different stages. But there are countries like Tanzania, where the Tanzanian president, he said, we will not have a lockdown. Life will go just normal. Just have some SOP, and they have been practicing. As a result, the lowest death rate is found in Tanzania. So was it a mistake to go ahead with the lockdown? Could we have been better off looking at the migrant workers in thousands and thousands walking the streets to the distant miles? So these are the questions that we would ask. So ethical questions can be raised, which have implications that are political, social, religious, legal. But we are not here to discuss about all these stuff. That's why the ethical aspect of this COVID-19 is very vast. So I am limiting myself, only the ethical challenges faced in the field of medicine, the medical practitioners face these. So I would like to bring to your notice that, for example, Hastings Center has come up with three tired approaches, duty to plan, duty to safeguard, and duty to guide. Whereas American College of Surgeons said, in our treatment, there should be transparency, advocacy, and commitment of support. So each bioethical center comes up with its own solution to the problem of the ethical challenges that are faced. So now let us take them one by one. First and foremost, 
can a doctor refuse treatment because of the high risk that is involved? We take a little bit of background from what we did in 1990s when it came to HIV. Because of the stigma that is attached, many doctors refuse treatment to these patients with HIV. But taking into account within a short time the benefit that is there, because early detection can cure the person to a certain extent or give him a better quality of life. As a result, many people came forward, even the doctors volunteered, taking safety measures to treat the patients. But when it comes to COVID, we should know that we do not have such risk of a stigma. Of course, in countries like India, still there is a stigma attached to COVID patients. But generally, there is no need to be have a stigma, but there is a danger. So the, can the doctor, because of the risk that is involved, deny or negate treatment to a patient? It is true. Doctor needs his own safety measures. He needs to have a surgical mask. He needs to have personal protective equipment, PPE. All these are to be pro uh, pro provided by the government. You know, Indian government could not provide. We did not have sufficient equipment that was necessary. Of course, now a company in China, in uh, Pune, is coming up on a large scale mask for the public as well as for the doctors. So our duty ethics or virtue ethics will certainly make the doctor come forward. A Christian ethics would demand that the doctor should volunteer, risking even their own life to the, for the treatment of their patient. I think this should be the approach that we would discuss about. The first point, doctor or a healthcare worker should not be negating or denying treatment to a patient who is positive, uh, COVID positive. Let us come to second point, public health versus patient privacy rights. Here, how is prioritizing patient confidentiality when it's being challenged by COVID-19 pandemic? The thing is, when it came to HIV, even the family people were not informed about it. Everything was kept very secret because of the stigma that is attached and the mortality rate was very high when it came to in the early stages of COVID-19. The antiretroviral drugs which are available today weren't available in those days. But when it comes to COVID, the very nature of infection makes it very necessary that we need to communicate, first of all, to the family members who are living, cohabiting with them. Even the hospital staff should know who is positive, who is not negative, because without which they will be endangering their own life. So there was there is a need that the confidentiality, the privacy of the person, for example, the medical record, we have got as priests, we have got the confidentiality that is to be kept in the sacrament of confession, which is the seal of confession is very sacred. So doctors, according to the Hippocratic Oath, they are also supposed to keep the confidentiality. But here, what happens? Why the doctor can open up and tell it to the hospital staff and to the family members? The reason is because the social health take precedence over the personal health because public damage would be much larger compared to the individual damage. So that is the ethical principle that will be followed about public health concern versus patient privacy. Third point, screening on priority. Which members of the population should be screened or tested for COVID-19 when available tests are limited? Screening and testing represent an ethical dilemma. So now, who should be screened is the question mark. Which section of the people to be screened first? First of all, we should know that in most of the countries, except the developed countries, screening is not available. In India, screening is not available for the whole population today. That's why we have got random screening. Just the other day, one of the parish priests was telling that the team is coming to screen our parishioners. Now look, they are a target group. They are targeting only the parishioners, few of them who are coming for mass. Such is ethically not acceptable. If you are going to a mosque or to a discipline or to your orphanage and screening, a random screening is all right. Otherwise, one could be labeled on account of the screening. So there is the ethical dilemma that is even screening when it is available, who should be screened first? Are not people who are more, who have, uh, is it asymptomatic or those with symptoms? We should have priority for those who are symptomatic 
than asymptomatic. They should be screened first. And should not the healthcare personnel be screened first because their life is in danger or they can pass on the contagion. So they should be screened first. So screening, who should be screened is also an ethical question. It is true. All should be screened, all should be screened in order to get the best result because one screening cannot give satisfactory result. There should be a repeated screening that is to be done. In order to do that, we certainly should avail of this facility and make it available to everyone. Any sort of only discriminatory screening is totally unethical. In early detection, whether it is in COVID-19 or with the HIV, they can certainly give rise to better treatment and better results. Now, one of the great challenging aspects is the allocation of the resources. You know that COVID-19 took everyone by surprise. In China, overnight, they built such a huge hospital. In India, they turned the railway bogies into hospital care centers. All over the world, everyone was taken by surprise. People in the first world said our health care facilities reach out to everyone. Even in America, it is said there were only one lakh ICU facility available, wherein there were two lakh patients. So you can imagine in advanced countries, if they felt this acute shortage, whatever countries like India and African countries, they faced a bigger problem. So the allocation of the resources, who should get it first? One of the uh, beautiful presentations which was made about it was uh, by the Los Angeles Times on 19th of March. A boy who was a diabetic of 16 years, a mother who is 25 years, a grandfather who is 75 years, all three tested positive and all, all had respiratory difficulties, challenges, and they needed a ventilator, and only one ventilator was available. Who should get it? Is it 75-year-old or 25-year-old, or boy who is a diabetic who is 16-year-old? So they put a dilemma in front of the people so that people understand the gravity of the matter. On a healthcare condition, on a daily basis, Italian doctors said, we need to decide sometimes who should live and who should die. In Italy, they made a norm saying that anybody who is above the age of 85 will not get a ventilator, will not get ICU facility because they were youngsters who are in the waiting list. So these things have come in in large number. So uh, we need to uh, look at it from an angle where we put it in two types of resources, which are the first finite and non-finite. What are the finite resources? Finite resources are like organs, kidney, heart, liver. These are the finite resources. Non-finite resources are PPE, masks, ventilator, ICU beds. Some of them put it in a different way. They put it like primary, secondary, and tertiary. Tertiary, they speak of only masks and sanitizers, only those things. Whereas secondary are about the ventilator beds, whereas the primary is with regard to the organs, such as kidney, liver, heart, all those organs that are to be for organ transplantation, which should be made available. So finite, non-finite, or primary, secondary, and tertiary. So this is the way how they allocate the resources. Now, the criteria that is to be followed is treat all equally, one of the principles. Second, preference to the worst cases. Third, first come, first serve. Fourth, maximize benefits, utilitarian approach, or rewarding social usefulness. So there are many of these approaches among them which one to select was a question mark dr Hiria said it is agonizing in this in the context of providing resources to the covid positive patient because they are on their deathbed conserving scarce resources some of the hospitals and private institutions conserve resources thinking that if we get so many patients what are the benefits that are needed so so that was another issue whether they should consume or whether we sh they should release the resources for those who are immediately in need of. That was another challenge that was placed. Uh, finally, we come to the conclusion saying that resources are to be always on medical merit. Protocol to be followed regarding non-finite resources. Finite, there should be a regulatory norm. Make equipments available and affordable. In India, we had cases, whether it's in Karnataka, whether it's in UP, 
even in Delhi, there were allegations which were made against the government, saying that ventilators, masks, PPE, all these were sold at a very high cost. The ratio between what was the real market value and what the, the government bought was practically 10 times, 5 times more than the normal value. So ordinary people in hospitals began to charge exchange. So ordinary people could not afford. So there were corruption charges about it. So ethics in this scenario is very essential. Who should get it? Sometimes people begin to say, one who can pay will get it. But that is not the principle. People should get it on merit. So it is very important that ethical norms be applied so that we make you avail this because human life is precious for every individual. The next one, expediting vaccine by compromising criteria. What ethical concerns are created by relaxing FCD, FDA or CDC rules associated with research and by relaxing criteria certification into the medical field? We all know that there is a big talk going on about vaccine. A normal vaccine takes a long period of time. There are six stages. For example, I just mentioned a few of them. Exploratory stage takes two to four years. Preclinical stage, again, two to four years. Clinical stage, two, it can go up till 15 years. Then regulatory review and approval. So it is a very lengthy process. When HIV came in, because of the difficulty of AIDS and the number of people who were dying, they had to cut short this process. So much so they skipped to some of these levels in order to get some medication that is available. It is not only for vaccine, even for curative medicine that was needed. So whether such methods are also being followed now when it comes to vaccines, the entire procedure is not followed by the pharmaceutical companies that have come forward. Now we know that by September 2020, we had around 321 vaccines companies or candidates all over the world. In USA, companies like Moderna, Pfizer, Novavax are competing with one another, each one coming. Recently from Russia, you know that they are already the vaccine. They already tried it on humans. And there is a collaboration going on between England and India to get the vaccine. In India, the Hyderabad Bharati company came up with the vaccine called Coaxin. But all these have to go through this procedure and final approval. By cutting short the very process, we will be risking a lot. It is the choice between the two. What are the steps that can be skipped? How much importance to be given? And what is the emergency that is there? As we speak about life and livelihood, the choice between the two, whether there should be a lockdown or not. So there has been a lot of debate. Now it has been America, it is going through a political debate between Joe Biden and Trump. In India too, some people say, well, lockdown should still continue. Others say lockdown should be lifted. So there is a debate going on. In the same way, we need vaccines. There is a group of people who say vaccines will never come because for the pandemics like uh, HIV and uh, um, dengue, we don't have a vaccine. Here also vaccine is not a possibility that will be covering because today we know that this particular COVID-19 disease the virus, uh, we find that SARS-CoV-2 is mutating so fast that it is not coming within the realm of a vaccine. The vaccine may be able to cover this 50 to 60 percent. That is what the experts say. It won't be all satisfactory vaccine. And if they come about a vaccine, certainly it will be a great success story. That will end up. Otherwise, this disease can go on. I was reading an article just today, which began two of the specialists in the field of uh, in this field, they have written an article in today's Hindu, you can read it. That is, uh, uh, we were speaking about herd immunity. The herd immunity is not possible today because there is a recurring of this disease again and again. People who have been healed and who have been negative, now they are getting it again. Does it mean their immunity level has gone down? They don't have uh, antibodies which were created during that time, those antibodies have disappeared. Or are they not able to resist? Or the, is the virus becoming stronger? There are so many questions that are arising. Some people are saying it will last for two years. Some are saying it will last for more than two years. Another three minutes, my friend. Yeah. Time is up. Handling of life issues. 
how should we address life issues this is another issue that is because most of the patients who are end up in a icu they will be practically in a life supportive system uh, hiv being a terminal illness that time they brought in a goal care discussed with the medical team and the pa patient family and everyone how to go about the treatment here also uh, nowadays they find the covid patient in the western world especially discuss with the patient how to go about it because the patient is taken into account the family and everything because they are near death cases whereas cpr is administered whether they should be administered it is not sometimes it is not possible you need to have protective equipment even when it is there if unless it is beneficial you need not give a uh, cpr to a patient so these are few of the aspects that could be handled about the end life issues so i wouldn't prolong because the time is up uh, now another ethical problem is the biochip uh, about which uh, now bill gates and their company has come up with the bi biochip which can be implanted which have got a lot of positive effect now we look at it from the early detection of the disease i have put various benefits of that but early detection of the disease but the negative aspect is issues of personal privacy it marks the end of human freedom and dignity can turn in every man and woman and child into a slave uh, cybernetic biochips can also uh, monitor your own alter your own thinking and even acting so we have got ethical principles at play bioethical principle principle of value of dignity of human life principle of justice principle of beneficence principle of equity principle of autonomy i am not going to explain and uh, ethical up to when there is a scarcity there are people who speak utilitarian approach deontological approach cost effective approach fair process various approaches we can have uh, about which but as a, in order to conclude we would like to go with the pope francis uh, fratelli tutti the third encyclical that pope has written which is also responding to covid-19 and all the situation of the world all over he brings in the aspect of good samaritan in luke chapter 10 37 who is my brother certainly there is the the samaritan is the one who reached out whether the medical practitioners the frontline warriors healthcare warriors everyone has the clarion call here that we all need to come forward in order to help the other we cannot shun our responsibility and that is what is needed the spread is very vast over 200 countries 40 million people and 1 million deaths and in spite of the dilemma of saving life and livelihood drugs have little or no effect this is something a i open world health organization has confessed that most of the drugs that were uh, 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 spoken of uh, remdesivir or uh, even we have got hydroxychloroquine and all those drugs that were even hiv drugs lopinavir and ritonavir these drugs are also not effective has been spoken by world health organization even in a 28 days trial so with all these things we can understand herd immunity is there in a way because in the slums of bombay it is around 57% whereas those who are living in a flat may be having around 16% in spite of that what is the future for this disease is not known so our approach should be a benevolent approach a approach of a good samaritan reaching out to everyone so bioethics should come forward so that we protect human individual because he is the image of god and it is our duty to work towards the saving as many lives as possible it should not be like the uh, spanish flu which took one third of the population uh, we should only collaborate to bring an end to this covid i certainly uh, thank you all for a patient listening and giving me this opportunity to present this paper thank you thank you father for a well researched article on ethics of uh, treatment of uh, covid 19 uh, you really um, explain in detail so many aspects it was an eye opener for all of us here even for medical people i must say um, uh, you talk like a doctor uh, on the front line uh, having got all the experiences thank you very much thank you thank you i appreciate it. uh our third speaker is uh, dr anthony divasia uh, uh he is a neurosurgeon professor and pass head of department at the uh, uh in the urology 
in CMC Christian Medical College, Bellore, a tertiary care center with 2,500 beds. He's a reviewer for national and international urology uh, journals. He's also an examiner in national and uh, international uh, urology exams. He is a, a very uh, academician, ad academically oriented, having have now 60 scientific papers, have written three book chapters in urology, kidney transplantation, tissue engineering from urine derived stem, stem cells. And uh, you also have written a textbook on emergency medicine. Dr. Anthony Divasia will talk to us on clinical bioethics perspective of a practicing surgeon. Thank you, Dr. Anthony Divasia, for having agreed to talk to us on this World Bioethics Day. Welcome. Thank you, Dr. Antao and the other organizers. And uh, thank you, Father Stephen, for having given me this opportunity to participate in the session. I must confess at the probably random musings, general concerns of a practicing surgeon. All of us medical professionals are faced with ethical concerns constantly at our work. Uh, I'm going to put forward a few of my concerns. I have been associated with Christian Medical College Velo starting as a, an undergraduate and then have continued here for almost 40 years now. All through medical training, this practice, ethical clinical practice has been drilled into us and, and we see it in practice here. So one of the things that intrigues me always is this common practice of seeking a second opinion. When I sit in my outpatient clinic, several patients come seeking a second opinion. And many of them probably go beyond and go to the next person to seek a third opinion. And in this context, it's actually this patient's way of double checking what's going on. It's not a, as though the patient distrusts the doctor. It's just that he wants to verify that it is truly the correct treatment that he is getting. And this is where the shared decision making comes. It's a collaborative process where an informed patient meets with the doctor and discusses. The patient might have got his information from the doctor relatives, friends, internet, and together a treatment decision is made. Keeping the values of the patient's interests in the background of medical evidence. All options are considered and the most appropriate option is chosen. I just want to put in a small scenario which we often face. This was concerning a urological patient, a 40 year old businessman with a renal stone, painful upper renal stone, went to a urologist and asked and uh, was offered endoscopic surgery. He went to another one, again he was offered endoscopic surgery. This was a man who was very apprehensive of surgery and when he came to the third urologist who looked at the x-rays and decided, Hello? Can you hear me? Yes, doctor, you can carry on. You can hear was, offer, was thought that the stone was eminently amenable to a non-operative treatment, something called shockwave lithotripsy, where the stone is broken up and the patient passes it out in the urine. And this was successfully performed. What exactly happened here? It was the doctor's duty to have informed of all the options to the patient. Maybe the 
doctors didn't inform he pref- he probably discussed the most preferred option that is the doctor's preferred option or maybe he did but downplayed the other options highlighting his preferred option that the shock wave needs a special machine maybe that machine is not in the hospital it may be in a hospital across the town maybe in another town and it's a slower process ultimately a good number of our patients will ask what is the best for me doctor and the answer would be probably what the doctor is most comfortable with i often wondered what the, the reasons for all this this not offering all the options are one i thought was probably an incentive for an intervention uh with say the operation fees and the hospital admits a patient that makes money this often doesn't happen in where the doctors paid a, a a fixed salary but there's no incentive or in places like national health service in the uk even if the patient if the doctor was not so inclined there might be a pressure from the hospital administration to reach a revenue target it, it's not uncommon it's a common knowledge actually to find that many small hospitals the cesarean sections go up at the end of the month probably to meet revenue targets or maybe the doctor thought this was a case good to demonstrate a technique to a trainee or maybe a recording for a presentation new ultimately the options were not offered this very often happens and i think as it says a duty to doctor to offer all the possible options this is yet another scenario often faced by many practitioners and this scenario in urology is of a 5 year old boy with a very severe form of a condition that affects the bladder and the kidneys it's very well known that the severe form the outcome is often quite dismal might require multiple surgeries may require eventually dialysis and maybe even renal transplantation and the matter doesn't probably end there it will continue to create problems and almost a lifelong problem and it's compounded by the fact that in this particular scenario they come from a very poor background what is the usual response many hospitals will say no treatment because of the problems that are involved so much of money so much of time such a long duration of treatment some others would take whatever the patient has got or part payment or even full tree and start the initial treatment pathway starting off the treatment it is done with very good intentions to help the patient but the harm that it causes the family is cannot be quantified in terms of loss of money time in fact we actually condemning a, fam- a family like that to severe debt publicize the need for finance maybe print tv social media appeal to uh, philanthropic organizations to generate the funds but generating those funds is that resource properly utilized is it justified to use that resource for this particular patient knowing the outcome or is it better invested in a in in a problem where it is more curative or is it justified for the doctor to discuss with the parents and an acceptance of death be a kinder option is it all right for the doctor to tell the parents that it is important to keep the child happy with whatever that is he he is comfortable with and not have an intervention at all or maybe even suggest another child are all these things justified one of the other concerns that all clinicians have is 
the scenario of medical prescriptions the irrational and unethical treat, uh, treatment with drugs various medication if you look at if one looks at any prescription standard prescription there will be about five drugs in it two drugs will be very similar one to counter the side effects there is likely to be a vitamin maybe a supplement maybe a tonic some of these drugs can be very costly in our country the one single factor which pushes people towards abject poverty is medical treatment and drugs constitute a big chunk of this so prescribing a costlier drug is it better most of us clinicians know that costlier does not mean that it is better our popular brands better than generics many of us know that the drug companies get their chemical from a bulk drug manufacturer package it and sell it in different forms at different rates finally the patient is a loser and it is us as responsible physicians who should be very careful in prescribing drugs and follow the ethical norm this is a cmc pharmacy uh, page it's actually a clinical workstation which shows how we prescribe if you go to this corner this is where if you type in the drug that you want here the options of the various formulations available in the pharmacy pop out this is a very simple drug that is often used in urology it is used for urinary infections if you look at this you can see that this particular drug 100 mg of this cost 11 rupees while another form 50 mg for 7 rupees so it's 1.4 on 1 rupee 40 paise is the price of the same cost that is 1 tenth the cost of this drug agreed the more expensive drug probably has a lesser side effect profile but we can ask the patient whatever that is suitable for him we can give so if we write a handwritten prescription the pharmacist works so as responsible people if we are careful we can cut down the chance of the expense there same thing goes with antibiotics very powerful antibiotics use for small uh, infections with short term gains it's like using a big bomb to take out a small target and that breeds resistant organism it is unethical in our country there is absolutely no regulation in the western world these are very very strictly uh, monitored and anybody cannot give all the antibiotics here even the smallest practitioner can give in a in a small nursing home can give the most powerful antibiotics that is available finally nothing would be complete without going into a little bit of the covid uh, scenario it has become a real a real it's a reality check for all of us none of us have seen anything like this ever in our I mean, most of us have never seen i have never seen and i hope we don't see this again when a covid in the initial phases when it started our hospital took a very firm decision that we will give the maximum care that is possible to as many patients as possible within our means so the entire hospital moved towards managing covid there were training programs for physicians uh non all the health workers and there was a covid command center set up and this and the beds were freely given out when in the peak time of covid there were more than 1000 beds of our hospital with covid patients there was level 1 level 2 and then the icus some funny things do, do happen also it was uh, one of the radiologists whose job was to take who was posted in on the rota to take x rays for covid patients finally he also met, got covid uh, nobody knows whether he got it from the patients i mean he had all the full protection while he was 
working, but he did get COVID. And he was sent to the COVID ward, the asymptomatic patient's ward. And when he went there, he had a lot of friends. Many of the patients who he had taken x-rays for came to meet him to say hello. Hello? Am I audible? Yes, continue, doctor. As far as surgery went, we had these priority awarded to patients. The emergencies were all done, right? Except for the first few, maybe a week or two weeks when we were trying to uh, find, uh, come to terms with the disease and how to manage it. All the theaters functioned as usual, but only high priorities cases were taken or emergencies. Many patients, of course, had surgeries postponed significantly. Uh, but one thing we do know that the incentive induced kind of operations definitely all over the country came down very significantly. Uh, fortunately, in our hospital, when in the current scenario, many doctors, nurses, healthcare workers did fall sick, but the percentage prevalence is much lower than the rest of the country. And by the grace of God, no, there's been no mortality. I think I will leave you with that. Thank you very much for having me. I really enjoyed being in this session. Thank you, Dr. Anthony Divasia, for uh, your uh, beautiful talk on clinical biotics, your experiences as a practicing neurosurgeon. Uh, Thank you. Uh, I now will ask uh, Dr. Anukant, do you want to say something? Yeah, a few comments. Uh, am, I, am I audible? Can you hear me? Yes, doctor. With all due respects to my speaker who just spoke, my colleague, the urologist, uh, let me start by a rebuttal of a few of the points he made. Nobody holds a gun to your head when you work in a private corporate hospital. If you can't meet or if you don't want to meet their requirements, they're running a commercial enterprise. If you can't meet their target, don't work there. Leave. I left. I left Bombay Hospital 10 years ago, 12 years ago. It's not, it's not a question of them holding a gun to your head. The second thing, to say that operations which had incentives changed with COVID, yes, they went down because the hospitals were closed, they were converted to COVID hospitals, they were not because the doctors were not operating, they were not allowed to. You also mentioned the United Kingdom. I have worked there for four long years. Do you know what is the waiting period? If a normal citizen wants a cataract operation done, the waiting period is 18 months. You want a hip, hip, hip replacement? It's more than two years. You decide. Because everybody is employed, is paid a fixed salary. So a knee replacement surgeon would do one knee replacement in a day and says, okay, my work is done. I can't do any more. In a place like India, imagine what would happen if each orthopedic surgeon, each psychiatrist like me would see four patients a day and say, that's it. My work is done. Who, who would look after? And as he said at the end, very rightly, even with a thousand beds in CNC Velour, finally, they had to postpone surgery. They had to postpone significantly, as he said, some surgery. Even the bed allocation is limited beds. So you have to choose whom to allot the beds, whose needs are more. And at that time, it is the clinician on the field who takes a call to question his morals, his ethics, is not I feel fair. 
for us to sit here and do that. I work in a government hospital, which has limited beds, which caters to three districts. And I know, even in non-COVID time, there is often an ethical dilemma of whom to allot the ventilator, whom to prioritize to admit to the medical ICU, whom to put on the emergency list of operations. That is the clinical ethical dilemma that we clinicians face because we cannot have unlimited resources. Look at America, look at Britain, look at France, look at Italy. You all remember the photographs of patients on beds with IVs waiting on the roadside or in the passages in those hospitals? Why? They have enough beds for normal folks. But when you have a calamity, priorities change. You have to make choices. And that is the reason why we are talking about the biomedical ethics, the clinical ethics. And I'm sure more than my clinical experience, what would be very much more important would be to ask a person like Father Stephen. Father Stephen, what do you think? I'm sorry. I, I didn't mean to offend. I'm no, no, sorry. I'm not offended, sir. I'm I, just saying. Uh, I, I didn't mean to offend. Please, I'm not offended. I'm just saying yeah. that I feel that without knowing the circumstances in which the decisions are being taken, we we are we are not right. Even in the case of offering any kind of treatment, the autonomy is there for the patient to seek a second advice, third advice, the third consultation, and then make an informed opinion and seek. Maybe it works, maybe it doesn't work. Right? We clinicians have to respect the integrity of the other clinicians. To the extent that we assume that they are acting ethically and following the four principles of beneficence, non-maleficence, justice and, not, and autonomy of the patient. But in terms of calamity, especially, like this pandemic that we are facing, there is, there is going to be a lot of playing God syndrome, where you would be in charge of a bed and you have three people waiting for the bed, in the end, whom you allot the bed with the ventilator would make you God for that person. That is something we must consider. Am I right, Father Steve? Yeah, so, yeah. So, uh, we'll give uh, Dr. Anthony wanted to respond to that. Yeah, yeah, please. Please, Dr. Anthony. No, I, I'm, I'm, I'm really sorry. I didn't mean it that way at all. No. I, I, I know. Then I, I speak. No, no, no. <clears throat> what I was thinking was like there were a lot of the, I, I know of hospitals where they used to do 100 angiograms a month and uh, patients were treated. Suddenly the angiograms and the stentings came down. Now we don't know whether not doing those procedures, whether they actually caused any harm to the patient. There's no data available and there's no, probably eventually it'll come by not doing routine procedure, whether anybody has been harmed. What happened to those patients who, some, the person who had a chest pain in the night, uh, decided not to go to the hospital because if he went to the hospital, he would get COVID. Therefore, he slept over it. Next morning in the night, he took some antacid and he became all right. Another day, another time, he might have gone to the hospital and had an angio and a stent put in, for all you know. Yes. So in that context only, I said that. Yeah, so probably he would have had a stent put in if he needed a stent. I'll tell you, uh, Anukan, to this, uh, uh, this was just a different perspective. Uh, as Dr. Anthony said, I had my analysis. Who, no, who, I just felt, I just felt that... Taking, taking a call would be the call of a clinician's integrity. Yeah, uh, Dr. Anthony said something about the cardiac thing issues. I had my anesthetist who thought it was gastritis and took antacid. And uh, it was so late that he collapsed and he died. Yeah. Exactly. So, when, when, just about 40. 
I, no, I, 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 I will, I will stop anyone. here. Please. I will stop here. Sorry, if I have. <laughs> yeah, I will stop here because I think yes, Dr. Antal's answer is answer enough to my question. Okay, just the other side of the story. Father uh, Stephen uh, will be now <coughs> uh, summarizing the um, all the three talks. Father Stephen doesn't require introduction here. He is a PhD in healthcare ethics, professor of moral theology. an architect of our uh, bioethics course it is because of his foundation laid down that we are here and it was because of him we could get all the three uh, speakers to celebrate the world bioethics day over to father stephen fernandez thank you so much uh, dr antau i begin with uh, the welcome address given by dr nicholas antau who is the managing trustee as you know for a number of years and uh, who has really added a flavor to this whole program and he has given in his welcome message the history of fiam he spoke about gene editing he spoke about father carlos honored by the church he spoke about the film there uh, of hari prasad mukherji they projecting doctor as hero and doctor as a non hero that was really very important point you may, made there and here's what he said is the punch line whatever good you do remains with you and gives joy so that's <clears throat> how we began uh, this evening's program we have then dr anukant mittal the academic dean and trustee of the center who is very much involved uh, in the unesco bioethics uh, programs uh, worldwide and he spoke about celebrating um, world bioethics day and here what he said <clears throat> we have to celebrate ethical values which began in the naples meet he gave examples of gene manipulation <clears throat> that is going on for a long time giving a vivid example of my sister's keeper and also the sense of duty of our pro profession he spoke about the need to keep of uh, keep considering the principles autonomy beneficence and ethical values in the healthcare so that's he summed up uh, uh, why uh, the importance of bioethics we come now to uh, professor mariel dr professor mariel she began with a quote of pope francis First of all, I thank her uh, profusely because she's our only foreign speaker. Thank you very much uh, if you're there still, and uh, it'll be it'll be great Hello. that you. You have so nice, so nice, really wonderful. She gave a brilliant presentation there, brilliant presentation, uh, and very uh, rich food for thought, which can keep us, uh, you know, for the whole year of our discussions on a very important consideration. she began with uh, the you know more than 100 murders taking place in mexico daily the live 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 situation of violence going on and uh, she explained the different approaches to violence that could come from individual groups institutions and also <clears throat> she gave the difference with aggression which is an instinct but violence is because of freedom of the will she then went on to explain the difference between conflict and violence the anthropological uh, nature of conflict uh, conflicts because of its diversity and then she spoke of how the road to peace transits to various conflicts conflicts can become an opportunity for growth conflicts must never be given never be justification for violence violence can lead to culture of violence becomes terrible and then she explained the various steps of the uh, um, structure the cycle of violence they how you move from the uh, the search for oneself the identity one important point she spoke was desperate violence when there is no essential uh, you know uh, uh, commodities for life food clothing shelter and that's how one aspect we need to look in she spoke about the root cause of violence and uh, there's where we need to go more uh, into the uh, really uh, the root causes to get solutions she spoke about the return to the world and how you know the dialogue between the aggressor and the victim and years where uh, the role of bioethics you rightly quote the role of bioethics comes in <clears throat> referring to johann galtung where uh, about the violence phenomenon direct violence structural violence and uh, a cultural violence which is more difficult to eradicate then she spoke how uh, bioethics and the road to peace begins with this ethics of life preventive and the mediator role of bioethics in the promotion of peace so here's where our role comes in very specifically promotion and defense of health 
integral protection of the human person and the environment and the search for solutions through effective dialogue so we have to open the channels for dialogue in all our ethical situations when there are a difficulties clarifications to make and just now just now we had a just now a dialogue right now at the moment between uh, dr anthony and dr anikon mithil for example a bioethics is important for the construction of peace and here where uh, dr mariel stressed a very important considerations the dignity human dignity which is one of the most essential principles respecting the dignity of every person the autonomy the and then uh, the last two she focused upon that sociability the transit from silence to speech uh, the amnesty forgiveness reconciliation these points i liked very much and reconciliation she said it needs the will of the people we need to reconcile many people are bitter they don't want to reconcile and that's a barrier uh, to dialogue forgiveness of course is essential and uh, you know it's, it's so 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 deeply rooted in a spirit of love and mercy and finally she spoke of restitutive justice are years where something is a challenge because many people after they do something there's there, there are you know that to to restitute becomes difficult uh, you know what we do sometimes we do restitution to the victims but also we have to see to the dignity of the offenders that's one point we need to look in last but not least she moves on to peace is not pacification and then she she gave the uh, beautiful saying of ignacio elacuria that is peace must be realized in truth constructed by justice animated by love and done in freedom violence is evident is there violence is performed by the will but the core elements of peace the construction of peace is a long and continuous process and i like the punch with the conclusion from saint pope paul the six words in populorum progressio the uh, the uh, famous encyclical on the development of peace that is development is the new name for peace in other words we need to develop development means the development not only economic development but the development of the okay. human person that is so essential for peace and uh, our uh, fiam center then will uh, dr mariel we will take your active suggestion your your not only your suggestion i mean your your thrust of your the essence of your talk uh, especially on this uh, new note you have given us this evening for our further activities uh, i i now move on to uh, father archibald gonsalves there uh, who gave a well researched and excellent presentation on covid 19 he spoke of the history of covid in line with other viruses pandemics the corona family viruses the severe acute respiratory syndrome the zoonotic virus coming from animals the incubation recovery period and then he spoke of the comorbidities situating their worldwide statistics and indian statistics there 74 lakh plus infected and over 1 lakh deaths and soon india is going to be the number one uh one number one infected place in the world and that's uh, you know that's something we have to consider he spoke about then the management of the disease the preventions the uh, basic sops and here's where he spoke on the various uh, ethical challenges he gave basically four ethical challenges can a doctor refuse treatment due to the high risk the public health concern versus patient privacy and he said confidentiality can be overruled because of the social health takes precedence and that goes back to also a supreme court judgment of india in regard to an hiv aids case that in a particular case that uh, you know uh, to save the life of a patient a doctor can disclose uh, you know uh, in the sense uh, to overcome because of confidentiality issues third he spoke about screening on priority who to test first etc last but not the least the most difficult aspect is the scarce allocation of scarce resources people on death bed and he concluded with you know the resources are on medical merit expediting vans, vaccines by compromising criteria very big challenge there and uh, the biotics implant concluding with the words who is my brother last but not the least we need to help others so that's the message we take from uh, father uh, dr archibald gonsalves reaching out to others in uh, um, you know in, in helping them especially in this difficult times especially especially covid 19 uh, there last but not the least we have dr anthony defacia uh, um, consulting urologist from uh, the uh, 
Christian Medical College, Vellore, with vast experience in clinical bioethics for a number of years. He has given a very lucid presentation there, the perspectives of a practicing surgeon from his personal experience, spoke about seeking second opinion, third opinion, and having a shared decision case. He gave two cases, the case of a 40-year-old businessman with an 8mm upper renal stone, and then another case there, where refusing treatment, the initial treatment pathway had to be found. The basic question there, finance, how to generate funds for a patient knowing the outcome. You know, so can acceptance of death be an option? So this is a very valid question we are going to take in when we do end of life care and when, when, when all the other options are closed, nothing else can be done to the patient. Can this be considered as an option, acceptance of that in message Pope, St. Pope John Paul did mention that, but in what circumstances he said, how is it related to, uh, to euthanasia, etc. That these questions will keep for uh, a forthcoming time. But right now we, 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 we thank uh, Dr. Antonio for, for being with us all the way from Velo. Thank you so much, doctor. And now I thank all the three speakers just to conclude. So these are my concluding remarks on uh, the uh, UNESCO bioethics uh, program we had today. I hope I've, I've done it in the 10 minute time I'm allotted. Uh, yes. Some questions. Very well done. Very well done. Father. Thank you so much. Father, uh, some questions from the delegates? Sure. Yes. So, uh, yeah. So first, uh, I, I would like to ask the other uh, speakers there. I mean, we have asked Dr. Anthony, but the other speakers who spoke, that is uh, Professor Mariel or Professor uh, Father Achi, if they have any one single question to ask quickly. I asked I ask Professor Mariel first being our international speaker, if she has any question or any final comment to make before we conclude. Um, thank you, Father Stephen Fernandez, and congratulations for the excellent sum up that you made. Um, and congratulations for all the speakers as well, for the organizers here. I am very pleased to hear the perspectives there in India that do not vary much from Mexico City perspectives. And uh, I, I would just uh, like to say that this, this COVID pandemic has posed very difficult um, dares and challenges for all bioethicists. But uh, even when we have an urgency for a cure, an urgency for a, vac for a vaccine, we, we should not lose perspective that we are always treating with people, with human beings. And just for that reason, we must have always in mind the consideration of the dignity of everyone. It doesn't matter if we have or do not have re enough resources. It doesn't matter if we are uh, exceeding the numbers of uh, contagious cases, confirmed cases, or deaths. It doesn't matter. We are in front of people and people deserve the most uh, irrestrictive respect for his or, or, or her dignity. So I would just like to pose that uh, because this COVID pandemic can drive us all crazy and can make us m make uh, bad decisions that we can lament uh, in, in the months to come. So just uh, calm down and, and, and take care of the people. That's, our, that's why we are bioethicists. People is the reason why we are bioethicists. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Maril, for your concluding work, focusing on care, focusing on dignity, need to keep cool and calm and proceed. We, we take your advice very seriously with us and we look for future collaborations with you uh, sure. again. So thank you so much. And uh, now I will ask uh, Father Achi if you have a quick question there or comment to make before we conclude and then we keep it open. Father Achi Bald. Thank you very much for the beautiful opportunity that I obtained where I could speak on COVID-19 and ethical perspectives. Uh, Father Stephen, thank you for inviting me as a guest speaker here. Uh, I am very appreciative of what this organization is doing and the great work and your initiative in this regard. The other two speakers really enlightened me with regard to peace as well as the clinical practice. I'm sure in COVID-19 context, we as bioethicians certainly could contribute a lot because many of the ethical principles that we speak of are not being uh, practiced in our Indian context. Indian context, we have got challenging situation uh, much more than uh, what we have 
spoken of challenging situation we have got a problem of corruption a uh, problem of uh, discrimination and uh, lack of resources and the healthcare facilities not available uh, where alternative medicines are taking also a leading role and sometimes these alternative medicines are uh, not uh, giving also a wrong treatment to patients whereby the persons are uh, uh, ending up as a casualty so i think uh, we as bioethicians certainly to give uh, certain guidelines to the healthcare industry that is working the pharmaceutical companies the hospital management the government uh, ethical bodies they should be guided and without which the covid is used by some people uh, for their political mileage some other for their economic gain i think it is our duty to streamline the right treatment and uh, the, during this pandemic time uh, that our people are because there is a lot of anxiety a lot of fear uh, people locked down and staying indoors there are job losses there is a lot of problems that are connected with right ethical perspective will certainly alleviate the suffering of humanity uh, once again i thank father steven and all the organizers of this uh, seminar on this bioethics day i am sure uh, this is a great opportunity we will look forward to greater collaboration in the days to come thank you thank you so much uh, father achi for that uh, wonderful sum up and especially the need for us to have proper guidelines so we can guide communities we'll keep that in mind when we uh, proceed with our activities thanks once again thank i got a uh, call from father uh, matthew kutino you know there is he there he said he like to talk please unmute yourself and speak for the matthew kutino i thought hello uh, hello everybody this is a little question coming from jerusalem uh, i just want to uh say uh, one remark i think in covid times we also have another challenge uh, i mean it was beyond the brief of father achi the challenge of the truth what is the truth because i think together with all the positive things and all the medical um, information that is coming there is so much of a misinformation so much of confusion to people and with the presence of social media we have a plethora of views being uh, sent out as if they are now gospel truth and i think this is where the people who will debunk the world health organization and say they are in the pocket of china there will others who say all that uh, you know i think this is a place where uh somehow the world has lost its moral ability to speak and especially people of north i think there is another place where bioethicians perhaps have a role to play just my remark thank you yeah thank you so much uh, uh, for uh, for the matic cutino on that important point about the challenge of truth we shall take this point in our future deliberations and see how we can uh, you know improve our uh, perspectives and now we keep it open to the anyone else there you can just uh, put your hand up or just make a sound so we know what question is there uh, no, we, no no yeah, yeah yes yes murdala joshi please yes please unmute your mic and speak hello Dr. Mrudala, questions in the chat box. I see. Put the question in the box. Is it, Doctor? Can you just help me with that point there? No, it's not in the chat box. Sharon, Sharon, any ah, questions? No the... questions. Okay. No, she said no questions. Father, okay. Any? Yes. Father, this is Cyril. Can I speak, please? Ah, uh, Doctor Anta is asking. Yes, yes. Okay. Please. No, no. Go ahead, Cyril. okay <laughs> i just want to thank everybody and the organization uh, and i am uh, really happy that i completed my uh, biotech course and uh, it has been uh, wonderful to increase per, uh, my personal perspectives and my character but also to uh, provide uh, help to our community our society and uh, uh, today has been a wonderful 
uh, this thing different perspectives it also teaches me that we have to respect uh, the uh, perspectives of others because we are uh, multiple society where we are all different people with different uh, uh, perspectives so it has been a great experience and therefore uh, i want to just thank you for the uh, stephen and uh, father uh, this uh, dr antav and dr mithal and all others who are a part of that not forgetting uh, sharon as well sharon as well because she has been a great uh, smiling face all the time during the year that i had been there thank you very much okay uh, before the vote of thanks if there are no questions can i go ahead with the please next go program? please go ahead please, doctor please please doctor to inculcate the spirit of uh, world bioethics day we decided to have this competition among our delegates doing uh, online course and to write, write some few lines about ethics and what does ethic in action means to me we had about 37 entries for this and uh, we had to it was very difficult to choose the best three from the 37 entries so we uh, uh, brought down to 10 and after that 10 it was uh, still more difficult to get uh, to the top 3 so i would like to announce the top 3 now um, sharon uh, we'll start with the uh, 10 number 10 yeah, yeah. sister natalia de souza then number 9 one minute Number nine, Derek Rodriguez. Uh, number eight, Anish Jones. Number seven, Nicole Cutino. Number six, Dominic De Souza. Number five, Doctor Anu Arora. Number four, Sister Yvonne Rodriguez. And the winners for this competition. Dr. Anta. All right. We start from down. Number three. Number three is Dr. Richard Pereira. Photograph. Oh, Thank right. you, Richard. Congratulations. Number two. Gracian Furtado. Congratulations, Gresham. What did he say? Can I show the slides? And number one. all this will be on the uh, yes doctor that's right right the winner is uh, the first winner is ethan de souza she said about uh, ethan de souza uh, can you put her uh, yes, lines again yes i put his line just like ethan Special morality in adhering firmly to the rules of moral human behavior, to be conscious of legal and moral norms of behavior in society, conscious effort to uphold ethical and moral values in and responsibilities, sincerity and emotional control while making decisions, always keeping an eye on being human, and protecting the human values, keeping the balance between principle, personal values, patience, and tolerance in forgiving others. Uh, that was very nice. and i must thank the judges uh, headed by uh, dr sheril nathan uh, to judge this uh, together with uh, jisel uh, ruan and uh, dr disuza uh, dr avinash avinash disuza uh, over to vote of thanks to dr jisel pereira jisel pereira jisel pereira jisel pereira santao Hi, hey. Jisel. Good evening, everybody. Jisel, uh, I would evening. like to. Uh, 
Can I start? Yes, please. Yes. Yeah. I would like to start with a quote by Randy Posh, who says, "Showing gratitude is one of the simplest, yet the most powerful things humans can do for each other." Today has been a very wonderful evening with super learnings, and it gives me great pleasure to thank all those who made this seminar possible. I would like to start with thanking Dr. Nicholas Anthau, Dr. Anukan Mittal, and all. those instrumental in putting the seminar together special thanks to father steven fernandez who is responsible for inviting our esteemed and knowledgeable speakers and also for his role in summing up the session but most importantly a very big thank you to our speakers professor Mari dr marielli reverend dr archibald and dr anthony devasya for all the knowledge shared and the time spent in enriching us Thank you past and present alumni of our FIAM courses the members of the BOT for all your support Sharon our manager for her availability her smile and promptness in all she does special thanks to Dr Ashok Sham of yes, Ortho Dr. TV who has streamed this live on YouTube and thank you for the jokem for the very well made invitation Thank you also to the judges who made time to judge the competition today. We are grateful to all of you who have joined us today and made this session a great success. We hope you have benefited and are enlightened. Thank you so much and God bless. Thank you Jisel for a wonderful uh, vote of thanks. Uh, Thank you doctor. Uh, end up the meeting now? Yes. Yes. Thank you, everybody. Thank you, Father. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Thank doctors. You. Thank you, doctor. Thank, Thank you, everybody. You. Thank you, Thank Dr. You. Nicholas. Thank you, everybody.